Well, good morning. Thank you for watching our service. That's been pre-recorded for Sunday, 29 March, 2020. Uh, welcome to Open Door Baptist Church. And for anyone else who is uh, watching along with us, uh, we, are, we are so glad that you uh, have chosen to do that. Uh, the program for this morning is a little bit like what we usually do. There'll be a mix of some songs and hymns. Uh, there'll be a Bible reading uh, with a message of about half an hour from God's Word, uh, concluding with uh, another hymn. I suppose the good news is that there aren't many announcements this morning. But it, what a blessing it is that, uh, as we do it every week, uh, we simply want to open the Bible and see what the Lord has said to us, and then to seek to use it and to apply it in our lives. So uh, sit back. Uh, you are allowed to relax, but I do hope that most of all that all of us will be attentive to what God has to say to us. And uh, may the Lord give you a very encouraging Lord's Day and rest of the week. Thank you. Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrows that fly by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in the darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, 
but it cannot come near you. Only with your eyes you shall look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all his ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra. The young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I'll set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I'll answer him. I'll be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation.
and though we are not together as we usually are and as we usually would want to be Lord you are in our midst you're the all present God and you're able to dwell among us even though we are somewhat scattered this morning and to help us Lord to worship you in spirit and in truth giving you the glory your name deserves we pray for those in our congregation that are uh, somewhat discouraged Lord some may be physically sick some we know are recovering from surgery Lord be with each one uh, Lord as many are going through different routines and uh, working from home or having some time off work whatever the need is may they look to you and put their trust in you we thank you for those missionaries whom we support today we know that there are some that like us are not able to have services not able to, to reach out publicly as we would desire and so we commit them to you encourage them today and as they use uh, as they use uh, social media as we are and many other sister churches from Melbourne and around the country and around the world we pray for each one that the gospel would go out and that many who wouldn't otherwise come to church would listen and that they you would direct them towards towards uh, websites uh, where they will hear the truth of God's word and not a false message but a word of truth and of hope and of rescue and of salvation so Lord meet with us today if people are sitting there on their own or with with maybe with some family members the most important thing is that you're with us and that you will Lord keep us for yourself and that you'll you will guide us and direct us Lord, every hour of every day. So meet with us in this service, we ask, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Greetings to Open Door Baptist Church. It's wonderful to bring a message to you today on Psalm 91. A friend for the fearful. A friend for the fearful. In last week's message, at least the one that I shared when we met for the last week at Botanica Springs, I made the point that we should make friends of the book of Psalms. God has given us 150 of them. I've heard that if you go through your life with even some close friends that you could count on one hand, just a few good close friends, that you'd be a very blessed person. 
Well, I've got some good news for you this morning, and that is that in God's book of Psalms, uh, we have literally scores of friends to encourage us in virtually every and any situation that we find ourselves in. Uh, From the scripture reading this morning, uh, we saw some tremendous truths about who our God is and what he has done for us and how we should respond to him. It was, uh, I think, in late December, uh, the, the very last Sunday of 2019 that I shared a message in my brother-in-law's church in Menifee, California. It was uh, called Truths for 2020, uh, taken from the Gospel of Luke, uh, l- looking at the story of the rich fool who uh, did not know that he would perish that very evening. And as I contemplated 2020, uh, really had no comprehension, certainly as as you did, Uh, what kind of year that would actually unfold. And so I think we're going to find some real help this morning in this tremendous psalm. We uh, don't know exactly who wrote the psalm. It doesn't have a a title attached to the psalm, as many other psalms do. And yet it it is universal in its expression of who our God is and what he is like. And how we can respond to him. Uh, in in the years I've been alive, there have been a few different sorts of fears I've had. Uh, I think of growing up as a child and and being aware of the nuclear threat, and being very fearful that that uh, World War Three could bring an end to everything. But God was with me, and God was with us. And remember, in September two thousand and eleven, uh, seeing the twin towers come down in New York City. Again, wondering, are we at the brink of the last great conflict? Uh, my wife and I went through some tropical cyclones in Cairns, as well as a economic recession. And uh, you wonder, what is around the corner? And yet God was very faithful to us and to many others. And so as we approach fearful times, we need to realize that God is the same, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we can wonderfully trust in him and look to him. And I hope that Psalm 91 will become a a very close friend and companion to us as we live out the rest of 2020, if the Lord will give us that, or if his son doesn't return before that. It's been said that in Psalm 91, we have uh, three voices. We have three voices. One writer but approaches this psalm through through different voices. Uh, In verse 1, Uh, Someone is being spoken to. In verse 2, someone is actually speaking and testifying. And then in verse 14, uh, someone who hopefully is reading the psalm and responding well is being spoken of. And so we get to respond to this psalm uh, at the end of it. Psalm 91 answers some critical questions that even God's people need to answer in these times. Number one, we need to answer the question, who is God? Secondly, we need to answer the question, what does God do for his people? What does he promise to do for us? And then thirdly, how should we respond? We're going to see who God God is, what he's done for us, but then what are we to do with that information? Well, first of all, let's look at The first verse in Psalm 91. In verse 1 and then in verse 2, we have four names for God. Look at the first part of verse 1. God is called the Most High. Uh, This stresses that God is without comparison. He dwells in the very highest heavens. Look at the second part of verse 1. He's called the Almighty. The Almighty. That's good news today. That God is strongest and he is stronger than all of our challenges, all of our fears, and all of the unknowns. He's the Almighty. In verse 2, he is Jehovah, the Lord. I am that I am, he said to Moses in Exodus 3. 
He's the eternal reality. Uh, he is the divine standard, the one who inhabits eternity. And then you'll see in the second part of verse 2, he is my God, Elohim. Uh, that name appears well over two and a half thousand times in the Old Testament. And uh, it is in the plural. Not that God is, is uh, plural, he is one. But again, to show us by comparison how great he is, sort of like the royal we. Uh, God is great above all and not to be compared with any other gods that are in this world. And so we have four names for God. And there are many others in the Bible. And yet God wants us, even at the beginning of this psalm, to think about his names because his names reveal things to us about him. Just like our names have a history and a context and our parents gave us our names for, uh, for, um, for meaning and significance and for testimony and for memory. So God's names tell us many things when we are afraid. He is the most high. When we're fearful, we can go to one who's the most important person in the universe. Uh, just this week, we learned that a very prominent member of the British royal family uh, fell ill to the virus. And there's no member of the royal family in any royal family, in any country, that is immune from physical danger, except our God, who is above all. Our God is the Almighty. We can pray to him when, fear, when we're fearful in great confidence that he knows our need and that he is able to meet our need. He is the Almighty. He is Jehovah. He's the great I Am. And we need to remind ourselves that as we live in this small paragraph of time, think about humanity living on this earth for millennia. And we exist presently in one particular generation. We will occupy one paragraph in the world's history. That our God stands outside of history. He is the one who dwells and inhabits eternity. Uh, th this surely encourages us when we are tempted to be afraid. But then wonderfully, the end of verse 2, he is my guide. Not just the eternal God, not just the all-powerful guide, the pre-existent God, but he's my God. Hey, that changes everything. That great God of the universe can be yours by faith. If uh, you're not a Christian today and you don't know him, you're a stranger to his grace, you need to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ so that the God of eternity can become your guide, your shepherd, your Lord, your master, your provider, your king and so psalm 91 gives us some great truths about who our guide is well there's a second question that psalm 91 answers for us and that is this what has god promised he will be for us what has he obligated himself to be for us because god really owes us nothing we owe him we owe him our allegiance, our life, our choices, our priorities. Christ ought to have the preeminence in all things, and yet God condescends and promises to be certain things towards his children. Let's look at what God promises to be for us today. Uh, look at verse 1. Look at verse 1. It talks about a person who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. This person has a place in the heart of the Lord. This person has a close relationship with him. And it says that he will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. There is wonderful protection. Protection. Think about the shadow of the Almighty. Think about a hot summer's day. 35, 40 degrees. We would do anything for some shade. Well, God is like our wonderful shade that keeps us from the from the destructive uh, rays of sunlight that that would hit us on a very very hot day. So we abide under His shadow. 
Uh, look at verse 9. Because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place again. We're talking about someone that has decided that they're going to trust God with their life. They're going to trust God with their safety. They're going to trust God with their finances. I trust we're at that place. Because the point is that we weren't in control of our health or our finances or our life anyway. Friends, we're not in the driver's seat of our life. We are barely in the passenger's seat. We are barely hanging on. God is in control. And yet we can make the Lord our God our refuge and know his protection and know his care and blessing. Uh, look at verse 2 of Psalm 91. Uh, God is our refuge, our fortress, the one in whom we will trust. In ancient times, a fortress was where the army gathered to, to, to plan. It was ordinarily a very safe place to be. We could say we've made the Lord our army base, our army base. Uh, there are some military bases around the world that would be very, very safe. Well, our God is even safer. Uh, look at verse number nine again. Even the most high, our dwelling place, our dwelling place. We live in a time when we've been uh, directed by our, by our authorities that we need to really keep mostly at home unless unless we need to go out. And so our our dwelling place has become for 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 us at this point, um, hopefully a place of security and safety. Hopefully, and yet we can be tempted to sit at home and to be fearful. Friends, we need more than our homes to be safe. We need to do more than follow the precautions of our government and we should. We need to put our trust in God who can be looked to, who can be depended on. Uh, uh, exactly at these times, Scripture tells us that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. So God is our dwelling place. He is our refuge. He is our fortress. Let me read some other scriptures to you that, that, that share the same things. Psalm 31, 15. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and those who persecute me. This has this idea of God protecting us from enemies because in verse 7, it says... A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand. This contemplates conflict and enemies, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes you shall look and see the reward of the wicked. You will see the end of those who forget God and those who live as though he does not exist. So a God is in perfect control. Look at verse number four. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. God gives us tremendous protection. Think of a mother hen and other birds that look after their young Think about a little Joey uh, uh, inside his mother's pouch. Same kind of sentiment. Think about a newborn in their mother's arms. That little one is going to have so much care and protection and shelter and refuge to be kept safe and fed and, and, and warm. Well, our God looks after us even more. Well, what, is, what exactly does God protect us from? Because Psalm 91 is surprisingly specific. It is surprisingly specific. If you read through Psalm 91, you find that, that God tells us that he will protect us from known and unknown dangers. 
known and unknown dangers. Look at verse 5, the arrows that fly by day. Well, you can see you can see things during the day, though arrows go very fast. Uh, look at verse 6, the destruction that lays waste at noonday, right in the middle of the day. Verse 13 talks about a lion and young lions. So there are known dangers that God will keep us from. When you look at the Old New Testament, it is the it is the internal dangers that we're at most at risk of. It's not really the car accident or the plane accident or those kinds of external dangers that the Bible mainly warns us of, though they are possible. Let me give you one known danger the Bible warns us of presumption, spiritual presumption. I know in Australia we're known for she'll be right, mate, but scripturally that doesn't quite cut it. Let me read from 1 Corinthians 10, 12 and 13. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. You think you're fine? You think you're okay? Think again, the Bible says. And then verse 13 tells us, No temptation has overtaken you except as is common to man, but God is faithful and won't allow you to be tempted above that you're able. But with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So that warning against presumption is followed by a warning to be alert to temptation. To temptation. You know, our hearts still want the wrong things even during a pandemic. It's possible for people to sin in the most usual ways or the most unusual ways during these strange times. We've seen people already trying to make profit out of this pandemic, uh, uh, trying to sell common goods at exorbitant prices, pretending to be safety officials and then entering people's homes and, and robbing them. I've heard reports of that from other places. So people can, can, can sin just like they used to. And even God's people suffer from presumption that, you know, we don't need to reach out, out to others now. We need to just retreat. Or I'd never sin like that other Christian I know. We never do what they've done. I'll know friends. I'll know friends. We're in great danger of those very things, probably worse with that kind of presumption Hebrews 2 1 says therefore we should give the more earnest heed to the things we've heard lest we drift away uh, you know when we meet physically each week in a local church assembly there is an accountability with that for me as well as you that each Sunday we're in one place hearing God's word and as I've mentioned earlier, as pastor, uh, standing up the front, people do tend to be creatures of habit. And so they do tend to sit in the same places. So if someone is away or sick, I, I, I tend to know it just because of how people sit. Well, those days are gone. I'm not sure who's going to watch this on Sunday morning. And I can only encourage you. In, in, in many ways, I'd rather you hear someone better preach. And there are many, many other options. But there is an accountability we need to keep somehow with each other. Uh, let's not drift away. It'd be heartbreaking to think that when we next get to meet, and I hope that's soon, but it may not be, that all of the Lord's people that we know at Open Door are back, with some visitors, of course. Uh, let's pray for each other that we don't drift spiritually. But there are unknown dangers. There are unknown dangers. Uh, we began to hear of this virus in sort of December, then January. Who would have thought it would have brought the nations of the world to their knees? Who would have thought? Unknown even to, or unforeseen even to our experts and to our leaders. Psalm 91 talks about the unknown dangers. It talks about terrors by night. It talks about pestilence in darkness in verse 6, the cobra and serpent in verse 13. 
Uh, it was a great danger in the ancient world, living in a rural scene where deadly creatures, uh, maybe almost as common as having pets, to, to step on a deadly animal would be almost certain death. Certain death. Unknown dangers. All of us have had a drastic change of circumstances. And I was just thinking today, we long for what life was like a few weeks ago. And then we're trying to deal with life as it is. And then we're concerned about what things are going to be like tomorrow. Are there going to be more restrictions? Am I going to lose my job? How am I going to pay the bills? And so we're, we're kind of in three places, in, in the past and in the present and hoping for a better future, unknown dangers. And friends, without God, it is overwhelming. It is overwhelming. I sincerely hope and pray that more people don't die by their own hand than by this dreaded virus. That that people would turn their attention back to God and back to his word because the unknown can be overwhelming. And I trust as God's people, we will make use of all of the heavenly resources God gives to us through his word. With change of circumstances bring challenges in our relationships. I mean, many of us are going to be at home with our families in greater quantity than, than we, we usually do because maybe kids are at school or one or both are out working. And um, let's face it, it brings challenges. It brings challenges. If your kids are used to going to school and you're used to having them have a school teacher and all of a sudden you're the parent and you're the school teacher all in one, this can be really challenging. And the Lord knows that. He understands that. We need to realize that countless thousands are in the same predicament. And God gives us his sustaining grace. Maybe you're burdened because you have a loved one you can't visit anymore. They're in a nursing home. Or people that are in need that you you know can't get to as, as you would. Well, you need to realize that they're in God's hands. And that means they're in the best hands. And so pray for them, encourage them, ring them if you can. Keep in touch somehow, but but just it may be that for the next little while that there aren't the visits that, that you would want, but those ones are in the hands of the Lord. So there are many challenges and unknowns, but not to God, not to God. I'm thankful there's one person in the universe that knows what will happen tomorrow and knows what will happen next week and next month and next year. Uh, he is a God to whom there is nothing unknown, there is nothing hidden. In fact, Psalm 139 tells us that he knows our speech before we even utter the words, before we even think about what we will say. God sees them afar off, our all-knowing God. I love what Paul says in Romans 8, 38-39. He says, I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing, anything, anywhere, in any time shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Believers cannot be separated from the love of Christ. It is impossible. Because we're united to Christ, we're, we are in him and we're in the Father and the Spirit is in us and dwells in us. Now God cannot turn away from his children. I cannot lose the love of God in this trial. You cannot lose the love of God in this trial. What a blessing that is. I'm thankful that these promises of Psalm 91 are wonderfully fulfilled in Christ. Wonderfully, ultimately, eternally fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Now, there is one little thing I want to say before moving on to our last point. 
And that is, there are some verses in Psalm 91 that you may know have been taken out of context. Been taken out of context. Uh, For instance, verse 10, No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. Sounds fairly absolute, does it not? And then it says in verse 11, And it seems to get better, For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Sounds incredible. And that's the passage that Satan went to when he tempted Jesus in the wilderness. He tempted Jesus to tempt God. Don't do that. We need to be sensible. We need to obey our authorities. We need to do all that they ask of us so that we can, as we keep hearing, to stay in front of or ahead of the curve. Be sensible. Not even the Lord Jesus Christ um, tempted the Lord the way Satan was getting him to do that. And so it's very disappointing when you hear of churches or other groups still meeting and breaking the rules as though God is going to just protect them for their foolishness. No, he is not. And so these promises given to God's people, as they obeyed him and trusted him, yes, God would keep them from their enemies, and at times he would keep them from harm's way miraculously. But we live in very different days, very different days. And we can trust God for our health, but the fact is we still die. And people are still dying of other things today. They're still getting heart attacks and cancer and leukemia. Christians are still dying, as well as others. And so God hasn't failed us because some of us got sick and passed away. No, he took them to glory. And he took them into a wonderful realm of eternal fellowship with him. And so let's not take God's promises out of context. Looking at his general protection of his ancient people and make them something that they were never intended to by the Lord. Well, how should we respond to God's goodness and his promises? Verse 1 talks about the one who dwells in the secret place. The one in verse 2 who says of the Lord that he is his refuge and fortress. Look down at verse 9. Because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. And then the promises start to come. What ought we do? Well, verse 14 and verse 15 clearly tell us. In verse 14, we are to set our love upon him. We're to choose to love God. You know, love is a choice. We can't just fall into love. We need to choose to love God. It's the first and great commandment because he, he because it, as you see in verse 14, he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. We are to love God. Look, the second thing we're to do in verse 14 is we are to know his name because he has known my name. Think about the four names of God in Psalm 91. We're to know them more and more by experience, by our trust. The third thing is we are to call upon him, verse 15. We are to pray. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. We're to pray. We're to keep praying throughout this trial, praying for others, praying for God's glory, praying that he would meet our own needs. In Psalm 118, verse 5, it says, I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. God did answer him, and God will surely answer us. So there are are three things Psalm 91 tells us that we're to do. We're to set our love upon God. We're to know his name. We're to call upon him. And hey, we're doing that together Wednesday night through Skype. 
and uh, it's uh, even more convenient for us to meet and to hear from God's word and then to take some prayer requests and to pray together. I'd encourage you to avail yourself of, of getting together Wednesday or other times with God's people uh, through through Skype or Zoom or other, other kinds of communications. So three things, but here's what's really interesting. For the three things that we're to do, there are six I wills in Psalm 91. Verse 14, I will deliver him. Verse 14 again, I'll set him on high. Verse 15, I will answer him. I'll be with him in trouble. Verse 15, I will deliver and honor him in the same verse. Then finally in verse 6, I will satisfy him with long life and show him my salvation. God will will one day glorify us. So for the three things we do, God does six. I mean, isn't that like God? For the few things we do, he doubles. In fact, he does infinitely. And thankfully, the I am of Scripture is also the I will. The one who can and who will fulfill every promise for his children. And so I hope you found Psalm 91 a friend if you're fearful today. I hope that, as verse 1 tells us, that if we dwell in the secret place of the Most High, we draw near him, we'll abide under the shadow of his presence. And I hope that, Lord willing, next week we'll return to Genesis and look at Jacob and continue on the life of the patriarchs but that we would use these times to reevaluate our spiritual health, our spiritual well-being, and find in this psalm and in many other places a friend for fearful times. God bless you. Great is thy faithfulness, more